democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we continue to look at the flooded Arkema chemical plant in the town of Cosby, Crosby, northeast of Houston, Texas, that saw a pair of explosions early Thursday, sending thick black smoke into the air, officials evacuated residents within a one-and-a-half-mile radius of the facility, which produces highly volatile chemicals known as organic peroxides. Well, a new investigation reveals the explosions come after Arkema successfully pressured federal regulators to delay new regulations aimed at improving safety procedures at chemical plants. It also found that Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton aggressively attacked a proposed chemical plant safety rule after his election campaign garnered over $100,000 from chemical industry donors. We are still joined by Nat Dempsey of The Houston Chronicle, but we're also joined by going to Denver, by David Sirota, senior editor for investigations at the International Business Times. His news story headlined, Texas Republicans help chemical plant that exploded lobby against safety rules. We welcome you, David, to Democracy Now! Before we go back to this chemical plant's history, tell us exactly what happened, David Sirota. How is it possible that people so threatened by this plant and more explosions are expected don't publicly know what they're being exposed to? Well, uh, the rule that is at issue in our in our story uh, is a rule that was proposed uh, during the Obama era uh, after the explosion, an earlier chemical plant explosion in West Texas. Uh, the rule would have required third-party audits of safety procedures at uh, chemical plants. Uh, it would have required uh, more disclosure to the community about what is in uh, chemical plants, what specific chemicals are being housed in chemical plants. And it would have mandated uh, better coordination and, um, and a closer relationship between chemical companies and first responders uh, and emergency services in those communities. And what ended up happening was, when that rule was proposed, uh, Republicans in uh, Congress, uh, top Republicans, uh, pushed forward a, a bill, a set of bills, both in the House and Senate, uh, to, to basically uh, delay and effectively kill that rule. Uh, and that was a way for them to signal that they wanted the Trump administration to kill that rule. As you mentioned, and in our story, uh, Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton also was one of, the, one of a number of, of Republican officials who sent a letter to the EPA uh, demanding uh, that the rule uh, basically be withdrawn. It was highly critical of the rule, saying it was overly burdensome uh, to the chemical industry. Uh, you had our Arkema, uh, in a letter to the EPA, basically making the same argument. Uh, and you had the American Chemistry Council, which Arkema is a member of, which is a big lobbying group in Washington, also making uh, similar arguments. And then what ended up happening was that the Texas, many Texas Republicans ended up supporting uh, the legislation in the Congress, as they have been getting uh, large uh, campaign contributions from the chemical industry, uh, legislation that would effectively kill those rules. Uh, and the Trump administration obliged. The Trump administration delayed those rules uh, until at least 2019, Scott Pruitt issuing that order. Scott Pruitt himself, as attorney general of Oklahoma, uh, he had supported, uh, he had demanded that the EPA withdraw those rules uh, while he was running a, a group uh, that had received $50,000 from the American Chemistry Council. So effectively what happened, you had chemical industry funded politicians who made sure and were successful in helping the chemical industry, including Arkema, lobby to delay and effectively, at least for now, kill those safety rules. So these rules, um, th the company, Arkema, poured millions of dollars into lobbying uh, right after the Trump administration, because the rules were going into effect on March 14th? Yeah, well, many uh, chemical companies, including Arkema, were lobbying against these rules. Uh, by the way, uh, during the Obama administration and then into the Trump administration uh, era, uh, through, again, lobbying groups like the American uh, Chemistry Council, uh, Arkema also lobbied on the rules. Other companies lobbied on the rules. I mean, ExxonMobil, uh, Coke Industries, uh, Sabic, the Saudi uh, Arabian uh, part government-owned uh, chemical companies 
conglomerate lobbied against these rules, and they were successful. And again, as campaign cash uh, had flowed into the coffers of many Republicans, many Republicans from Texas, who ended up supporting uh, the legislative effort to get rid of the rules, and ultimately the Trump administration acted. Mm. I wanted to bring Stephanie Thomas into this conversation, Houston-based organizer for Public Citizen. Your response to what's happening right now in Crosby, uh, to what the public has a right to know? Yes, Amy. Um, yesterday, I drove from Houston to Baytown, which is about 15 miles uh, south of Crosby. And in that drive, I could see the plume of smoke coming toward that community. And people are very concerned about their health, about their well-being, whether the air that they're breathing is really safe to breathe. And there's this complication, because right now, there's also a lot of flooding that has happened in our area. So even though they did evacuate the one-and-a-half-mile radius, there were people outside of that radius who were considering evacuating and weren't sure if it was safe to do so, if the roads were going to be passable, because we still have a lot of water on the ground here. And I think another point of this is it's contributing a lot more um, concern about air quality. We already have seen a lot of um, reports to TCEQ, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, about emission events during the past week due to Hurricane Harvey. So people are very concerned about what they're breathing in and whether, whether this is as safe as the officials are saying that, you know, that, it, that it's safe. I mean, this issue um, of emergency one, responders, you have the sheriff's deputies, 10 of them, went off to the hospital. That's right. That's right. But there have been other folks saying, well, it's like a barbecue. You don't want to breathe the, the air in because it's not good for you. But, but they're downplaying playing the safety of it. So I think it's really important for the community to find out what it is that they're breathing. And I really want to commend Matt Dempsey for his work in trying to get those answers. So, Matt Dempsey, you were able—first, you asked um, CEO Rowe of Arkema um, on the telephone. He said he wasn't going to give you the information. Then you sort of got a little uh, info dump uh, from the company. What changed in that amount of time? Um, and what would you say to people now, given the information that we know? So, what the, the only thing I can think of that changed is— there was a lot of attention to the presser that, that where they said they wouldn't provide it. And then I believe so the other thing that about the info dump that I got, that just list of chemical names, like 29 chemical names, and that's all it is, right? That was I, I sent a very angry email asking where why is I why did I not get the tier two? And their response was that the Texas Commission for Environmental Quality has informed them that all requests for the tier two should go through them. Uh, the interesting thing about that is that means we probably won't get access to that tier two ever, because when Greg Abbott, that now Governor Greg Abbott was then attorney general, his office issued a ruling that said that people don't have the right to access tier twos from the state. So now the state is telling a private company, Arkema, to ask the state for information that they know they are not going to provide. It's really incredibly frustrating. Now, your knowledge, Matt Dempsey, of the Texas delegation, the congressional delegation mm -hmm. that got money um, t t and was lobbied by Arkema to exempt them from these right-to-know laws. Yeah, so I, I thought David's piece was really excellent, but I do want to point something out. I don't think it's a hard push to convince politicians in the state of Texas to do what the chemical industry wants them to do. Like, for example, we, there was a lot of focus on the Republican delegation uh, from Texas. Democrats haven't done very much, either. Like, there's been very few bills proposed by Democrats in Texas or in the Ship Channel or in the metro, Houston metro area or along this petrochemical capital of the country um, from either party on increasing or strengthening right-to-know laws. The stuff that the information—the rules that David was bringing up, 
That was done by President Obama as an executive order after the West incident. And the American Chemistry Council is extremely powerful. They basically call the shots when it comes to what people get to know and how the chemical industry is regulated. Like, a really good example is it took decades for the Toxic, Toxic Substance Control Act to finally get passed. And in a lot of ways, it only passed because Frank Lautenberg died, and they met his colleagues in Congress felt the New bad Jersey that they hadn't senator. It up to that point. Yeah, right. So even then, though, the only version of the Toxic, Subst Toxic Substance Control Act, which is more about consumer act, uh, substance uh, effects by those substances, the only version of it that passed through Congress and got signed into law is the one that the American Chemistry Council essentially approved of. Can you talk more, David Sirota, about the role of Scott Pruitt, Scott Pruitt, the head of the Environmental Protection Agency, when it came to um, what the public has a right to know? And, of course, we're seeing it playing out right now with, uh, ex for example, in Crosby with the company Arkema. Sure. Uh, Scott Pruitt, when he weighed in on the proposed safety rules that we're discussing as attorney general of Oklahoma, Scott Pruitt made an argument that, that many attorney generals uh, who were opposed to these rules in the states, that they were arguing as well. And that, and that argument was essentially that the expanded mandates for the public's right to know uh, the expanded mandates for those uh, would threaten national security by allowing the bad guys, basically terrorists, to know where dangerous chemicals are. So they were basically arguing by allowing the community to know where potentially hazardous, poisonous material is, uh, both, uh, both in normal practice and even during and after a, a, a catastrophe or a crisis, that even allowing the public to know would potentially empower uh, terrorists uh, to know that information and uh, organize attacks, potentially, on those chemical plants. And that, so thereby, their argument was, Scott Pruitt's argument was, that allowing the public to know would be an undue uh, risk of, for national security. And he said that, that the rules should be withdrawn. Now, the other side of the argument was, of course, that the public should have a right to know about the chemical compounds in its communities, especially when it comes uh, to uh, emergency situations. Uh, but ultimately, uh, the Scott Pruitt side uh, won out, because he went on from uh, Oklahoma attorney general to become the EPA administrator, who eventually and ultimately delayed and effectively, at least for now, killed those rules. Let me ask you, Matt, um, talk about the record of Arkema over the years. So, the Arkema facility in 2011, and I believe it was 2015, was cited by the by TCEQ for essentially for a fire that started with organic peroxides in 2011 and I believe in 2016 for not being able to control the temperature in a reactor very well and then last August the um, OSHA's fined them a couple uh, tens of thousands of dollars for mishandling having essentially process safety violations for hazardous materials essentially they were mishandling hazardous materials um, we're talking about the Arkema plant in Crosby. I want to go to a clip of uh, the local CEO. But before I do that, I just wanted to ask, in terms of circumstances on the ground, um, for uh, Matt, how are you doing? How is your house flooded? How is it to work under these circumstances? Right. Um, we are, my family is incredibly fortunate. Um, the, our neighborhood got flooded. Uh, we had water water in the street in a lot of areas, and some houses got flooded near us, but the water never got up to, like, our driveway or over the curb near our house. So I feel incredibly lucky and fortunate, and actually, I feel a little bit of survivor guilt, because so many other people have been impacted so strongly by the floods. Uh, it's a little easier to get around now, um, but when you're driving around, just even getting to the studio today, you see just people starting to already gut out their homes and doing demolition. and. You see sandbags out still, and there's debris all over the road still. It's it's really hard, even though Houston's had three major flooding events in the last three years. It's still really—this is different. Uh, it's a different kind. 
Um, I'm from Phoenix, and when I moved here three years ago, every subsequent flood event that we had up to this point, people used to say, oh, it's not as bad as Tropical Storm Allison. Uh, no one's saying that anymore, um, in a not good way. It's, it's rough. It's really rough. And Stephanie, what about you? Yeah, I, I am likewise lucky that my house did not experience any flooding. We just had some minor damage uh, with some water coming in through the roof. But um, I live not too far from Buffalo Bayou, which is one of the, um, one of the bayous going through town. And uh, you may be aware, Houston has no zoning, and uh, our neighborhood actually has some industry smattered amongst it. And I was taking uh, a walk along the bayou and encountered a spill coming out of one of the facilities into the water, uh, into the Buffalo Bayou. And um, I I'm noticing that there's been several of these small events happening locally, too, as well as these big events like the, the Arkema chemical fire. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, the, the, that brings up a good point. So the analysis we did for chemical breakdown showed that there was a number of facilities—we essentially made an index that ranked facilities on their potential for harm. And we had, like, 55 facilities that were, like, the highest potential for harm. I'm doing a really shortcut version of this. But my a really, really quick and dirty analysis that I need to go into more detail on that I did yesterday showed that there's 13 of those 55 are in the 100-year floodplain. We're way past the 100-year floodplain with this flood. In fact, Arkema was in the 500-year floodplain. So one of the things that I want to do as a reporter going forward is find out just how many of these facilities that have highly, da highly potentially dangerous chemicals got impacted by this flood, and we just haven't heard about it. It, there's a lot—there's more than 2,500 chemical facilities in Houston. They're all shut down due to the flooding, and they're all going to start up soon. The Chemical Safety Board sent out a safety alert yesterday warning companies to be extra careful and make sure they're doing their due diligence on doing startups, because startup and shutdowns is when most incidents occur. And so I'm genuinely worried, both from an environmental perspective and from a public safety, like, and a hazard perspective like Arkema. You know, what's going to happen when all of these facilities all spin up all at the same time after encountering essentially like biblical proportion flood? Yeah, and, and along with that, um, a lot of the advocacy work that I've been involved with alongside many other really wonderful organizations in Houston, um, we have focused a lot on the ship channel. And Arkema is actually not really directly in our focus because it's further back, mm -hmm. but I think we're finding a new normal where these incredible rainfall amounts. I mean, there's about 42 inches, I think, in, in Mont Bellevue, which is close to Crosby. Uh, these are just phenomenal rates of rainfall within short periods of time. So when people and in industry consider risk management, I don't know that they're thinking about risk management in, in that kind of way, in terms of the amount of rainfall that they're experiencing. This, this is a whole new ballgame, and people need to start thinking about things differently. I want to go to Arkema President I, Richard I, Renard, okay. the president of the Arkema Division, speaking on Thursday. I mean, it's—I uh, I don't know the composition of the smoke, but it's certainly noxious. But you're not going to say that they're non toxic correct? Are you going to say they're non toxic or you're not? Yes or no? Um, <laughs> I, think that's, I think it's a pretty important. Uh, it's a pretty important. I mean, the, this the smoke is noxious. I don't, it's toxicity is, yeah, it's, it's a relative thing. I mean, the toxicity is a relative thing. Um, Matt, we're going to end with you on this point. This is after the explosions, after people are evacuated for a mile and a half radius. Can you respond to what he has said? Well. In some way, in a weird, like, pedantic kind of way, he's right. Toxic Toxicity is relative. So the government does me measures, like, exposure rates for certain chemicals. And the way they measure it is, like, how much of a chemical will kill you, how much of a chemical will disable you so you cannot get away to help yourself, and then how much of a, chem how much of a material will be very uncomfortable. You won't like it, but you won't. You'll be able to get away. You'll be able to remove yourself from the situation. So toxicity is relative, but it's kind of nonsense to say toxicity is relative and not explain how toxic. Then it's almost like a joke. So it's toxic. Well, how toxic? Even though we won't say that it's toxic. So 
my my thought, honestly, from what I know of the stuff that's burning the the organic peroxides, is that it's more likely in that we're expe experiencing exposure levels on that last part. That that it's irritating, it's uncomfortable, it'll affect people with cardiovascular disease or asthma. But it's something you could probably escape from. You can get to your home, you can shelter in place if you needed to. But Matt, but very quickly, the, like I said, yeah, go ahead. I'm do sorry. you accept? Do you expect more explosions at the plant? Oh, absolutely. The company has said that. The company has said they expect all eight of those freezer trailers that each have 32,000 pounds of organic peroxides to explode in the coming days. We're going to leave it there. Matt Dempsey, thanks so much for being with us, lead reporter for the Houston Chronicle series Chemical Breakdown, which investigated regulatory failures of the chemical industry. Stephanie Thomas, Houston-based organizer for Public Citizen, both speaking to us from Houston, the Petro Metro. Um, and David Sirota of The International Business Times will link to your piece as well. Texas Republicans help chemical plant that exploded lobby against safety rules. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, we'll be speaking with the head of Greenpeace here in the U.S. Stay with us.